All right, so I took a bunch of notes on this and we've only got an hour and there've already been a lot of good questions submitted, so I don't know how much we're going to be able to get through. But I whenever I, I speak publicly, I have to kind of run it by Oculus Facebook to make sure they don't have a problem with the topics or the the venue, which is, you know, which is fine. And the last four years, I've been doing one university talk a year, uh, and I've done SMU before and UT and uh, Texas A&M. Uh, so I was kind of surprised when the chief counsel at Oculus expressed some reservations about me speaking at a law school. The way he put it, uh, these sorts of things are where the baby sharks sharpen their teeth with questions. <laughs> and that's why we're going through this little extra review process on all the questions so nobody hands me too much of a zinger. I, but the, the topic of innovation and invention uh, is certainly near and dear to my heart. But very specifically, the last talk that I gave at Texas A&M, there was an interesting question there. Uh, I was speaking about the, the kind of unconventional and innovative techniques that I had developed for a lot of the generations of gaming engines that I had made. And you know, I ran out of time and only made it through some of the early generations of things. But it still was interesting to take a retrospective over that. But afterwards, one of the students asked me a question that I had never gotten before. And he said, why did you think that you could solve all of these problems? And I was a little bit taken aback by that because I'd never really considered that as a question. But uh, it's obviously kind of important because if you don't think you can solve something, that's a pretty big obstacle to you actually solving it. And conversely, when you know something's possible, like if you've seen a competitor uh, produce a product and you've got an existence proof, that makes it ever so much easier to actually go ahead and find the solution yourself. So there's something important about this idea of belief whether something is possible or not. And I think one of the largest scale examples of this is Moore's Law. This notion that the number of transistors you can put on a chip doubles every 18 months. There's nothing about physics that makes this a law. This is not like gravity. This is something that I more observed from the early years of the semiconductor industry saying that, gee, it looks like we're doing this about every 18 months. And it looks like, well, I can see a couple years out in the future, it looks like it's going to continue. I'm just gonna state this as a trend line. But here we are decades later, we believed it and we've made it happen. And what people don't realize is we just kind of think, oh, computers naturally get faster in so many cases. But these are you know, hundreds of brilliant uh, innovations being done by tens of thousands of engineers, but they all believe that it's possible. And this belief lets them kind of make this kind of tidal wave of innovation happen kind of over and over kind of repeatably here. Now, in my particular case, uh, I never felt that daunted by the, the prospect of innovating in some new area here where, I mean, I was objectively a pretty smart guy, but when I was looking at what I was doing, it's not like I was trying to solve Fermat's last theorem, something that generations of the greatest mathematical minds had beat their heads against a wall in vain for for centuries. You know, because of the exponential nature of computing, thanks to Moore's law and so much, uh, each year, it's, there's new kind of untrammeled ground where there are new opportunities that really weren't there before because you didn't have the same set of circumstances. So you're not just kind of scraping for scraps left behind by the geniuses of ages past. You really do have all of these great opportunities to find new things because in the past, they didn't have the same, you know, the same circumstances that you have. And while you can say, yes, you could get more computing power if you paid more money earlier, the, the common things about how the cell phone in your pocket now has more computing power than the massive government supercomputing labs of not that long ago, it means it's different because they weren't going to try to write Flappy Bird on one of the ASCII uh, supercomputers. So people try different things in the different circumstances. And also, the solution space for just about any problem is so vast. There are so many ways to attack problems and so many solutions that you can get for them. You're not hunting for the one solution, the one magical thing in this vast space. They're all over the place and any one of them will work. And when I was specifically talking about the, the game engine engineering, I could point to a couple things like, okay, I did side scrolling this one way and then I did it another way in the game after that. And they both worked. They had different characteristics. I had competitors doing Doom clones one way while I was doing it a different way and they both worked. You know, they were both valid. So, um, and also the, 
almost nothing is fully optimized. Uh, there are very few things in life that are sort of at peak theoretical performance. There's a few interesting cases where you can say there's some very high performance rocket engines that uh, the combustion chamber can achieve 99% of theoretical peak performance to say that it is within 1% of, as we understand the laws of physics, allow us to achieve the efficiency from a given mixture ratio of propellant and oxidizer. And that's an amazing thing to say. We're within 1% of the best it can possibly be. Now you could read that to say, well, doesn't that mean rocketry is very near the peak of what it could possibly be? We're never gonna get our cities on the moon. We're never gonna go to Mars because we're within 1% of the best we could theoretically ever possibly be. And that's not true at all. Because while we can say that one little piece, the efficiency of the combustion chamber is very, very close, everything else around it, the mass of the combustion chamber, the volume of the engine, especially the cost of the engine, and even more so, the whole system that that fits within, all of those things might be a full order of magnitude or more off from what's actually possible. So looking at that, you could look at it the pessimistic way and say, we're already really close to tapped out. Or you can look at it the more expansive and optimistic way and say, no, there is this immense amount of stuff that we can do to solve this. And practically everything in the world is like that. I mean, you can look around the entire world and say, we could get lighting better, we could get projectors better, we could get microphones better, we could get photography better. All of these things can be better. And there are people working on innovating in all of these areas and making good progress. It's like an infinite to-do list. You can just look around the world and see all of these things that can be improved by some vigorous application of engineering and innovation. So, you know, I look at this, I take this very optimistic worldview and, uh, and it's exciting for me. And I wanna uh, kind of emphasize that a command to innovate now on one specific thing, it can sometimes work. You know, I, I can be tasked saying, this needs to get done, figure out a way to do it. and. That can, uh, you sit down, you go through the whole process, you work on it, but there are much more, you're much more likely to hit on a successful innovation if you're open to multiple innovations at the same time, where instead of just saying, this is my problem, if you've gotten to a point where you hold lots of problems in your head, lots of things that are interesting, things that you want solutions for, when you're trawling for, for different ideas and building up things like that, being able to bump into something almost serendipitously uh, you're, is more likely than sort of this focused monomaniacal uh, application in one direction. Now you may not be able to take advantage of it depending on where you are or what you're doing, but that's the type of thing that could be pivotal to your life if it led to the founding or joining of a new startup company or something that was building an innovation that winds up becoming really important in the future. So um, all innovations will start with an idea at some point. And it was interesting, a few, uh, few years ago I was reading uh, Nassim Taleb's book, Anti-Fragile. And it's an interesting book in a lot of ways, but one thing that really clicked for me was how my idea creation process had evolved over the years. And the basic idea is that something is anti-fragile if you can get strong upsides from something, but the downsides are minimized in some way. It's asymmetric. And I could remember as I, when I was younger, when I would have a brilliant idea, I would get that eureka light bulb moment on something, like a new way to do shadows or a way to solve the potentially visible set problem. And you get that kernel of an idea, and it is sometimes like a light bulb going off over your head, and it's like, you know, this is amazing, this will solve everything. And you ride that high for a little while, but then eventually when I find out why it doesn't work, why it's fatally flawed, I can remember that used to really bum me out. I would be kind of crushed and depressed, and it's like, ugh, I, I was feeling so good about that and now it's totally not going to work. But what I've evolved to over the years is a, a very different kind of relationship with my ideas where I'm still happy to get that light bulb initially, but then I immediately get a very adversarial stance uh, against my own idea. It's become almost like a puzzle game where the challenge now is to find out how to bust it. You know, how do I break this idea? Which means that it becomes almost pure win through the entire thing. You get the eureka and the light bulb, and then you kind of gear up for the hunt, and you get the chase of that down, and then either you get the satisfaction of, okay, I nailed it, that idea is busted, I'm on to the next one, I go make up something else, or you get the satisfaction of like, this is gonna work, this is, this is an innovation, it's going to amount to something. And, uh, and it, this happens all the time, you know, dozens and dozens of ideas. I've got a couple kicking around in my head right now, 
And there's, there's some interesting side effects to this where sometimes I'm not able to kill an idea and it haunts me for like years afterwards. Like I have a couple ideas that could potentially be revolutionary and I can't quite convince myself that they do or don't work for sure and I haven't been able to devote the time to, to actually going and trying to implement them. So that's the type of thing that I'm laying in bed sometimes and my mind turns to this idea that I've already rattled around far too many times and it's sucking up a little bit of uh, you know, a mental effort that could be done better elsewhere. I am, I, a point I try to make to both technical and design people is that ideas don't usually come from just staring into space and waiting for inspiration to strike you. There is a mechanical process that you go through or you can go through to farm ideas and innovation where uh, it's a matter of Again, like I said, having as many questions as you can available. The more things that you have, uh, that you're aware of the problems and that you're interested in, uh, the more time, the more things that you can possibly get that way. But then being open to solutions, not just looking for the one specific thing, but waiting for anything to hit you. And then you farm it by exposing yourself to lots and lots of ideas, lots of reading, lots of perusing other things, taking some notes, going and back reviewing your own notes, because sometimes you know you from six months ago is practically a different person. And that's one thing I really don't do enough of. I One of the downsides of being a you know, sort of gifted uh, child early on is you don't learn good study habits and how to take good notes and so on. And only as a 40-something person do I finally actually start annotating my books and reviewing some of my notes and doing some flashcard things. I, but this process, again, you can multiply your odds of hitting on some of these things by a full order of magnitude just by having a better stuffed array of questions that you care about the answers, you know, when you're looking at these different things. I am, and I do, I, everybody talks about the virtues of a solid work-life balance and all of this stuff, but I'm usually the one waving the flag for, no, there's, Work-life balance is fine, but there are a lot of benefits to obsession. And I, when you obsess over things to the point where whatever your problem is and whatever you're immersed in is creeping into your dreams in different ways, you know, sometimes that is the path towards making breakthroughs in some things. I am, you know, there's there are limits obviously, but uh, I've been pretty comfortable working fairly long hours through my career up to now. I'm 47 years old. Uh, and it's still going pretty good, and I think I've got a lot of that ahead of me. Now, I, I critique ideas for free. I'm usually happiest to do it publicly. If somebody shoots me a message on Twitter or sends me an email, I, I will you know, freely give a thumbnail response to, uh, to an idea that people propose. I prefer it to be done publicly so multiple people can benefit from any feedback that I give, but I'm... Everyone, it's not that uncommon for me to get hit up by somebody that has the pitch that I have this breakthrough idea, I need you to sign an NDA so you won't steal my idea. I, and often even so much as, uh, you know, I'll let you implement it for me. I, you know, I, I get a lot, it's surprising how many times that's happened. I, and I get the impression that often I'm able to convince the people, it's like, I'm not going to sign an NDA, send me the idea anyways, it'll be worthwhile. And almost invariably, it's something trivial or, or just broken, something that doesn't work. But I, you know, I get the sense that this is the first time that these people may have had an idea, and they think that this is, okay, this is the moment, this is the moment that the great inventors all have, and after this, you know, I become... People throw me millions of dollars and I get rich and successful and all that. I am, and it, I slowly try to break it to them that that's not the way that I, you know, this actually works. I am, and there's, there's a quote from the, the science fiction author Robert Heinlein that I always really liked where he said, uh, a good idea is worth one bottle of scotch. And I think that, uh, you know, I, I don't actually drink myself, but the notion of something of a modest value and reciprocant, I am, you know, receiving something like that seems reasonable there where somebody comes up with something clever, you can say, that's smart. You know, there's, that happens a lot. And it seems to be worth something. It's not worth nothing. But in the larger scheme of things of what turns into million or billion dollar industries, it's really not just the idea. Uh, another Pineline story related to that was uh, he, had, he once had an author friend that was 
stuck in writer's block and was really well, kind of dead in the water. And Heinlein sent him a whole page of story ideas, you know, any one of which could have turned into a great story. And that's also a useful point that most of the people that are innovators have more ideas than they can actually pursue. Where again, there's value in ideas, but it's not, you know, the great big thing. The process of turning the ideas, you know, into reality is where the rubber really hits the road. And most people don't, that part's not glamorized. You know, you talk about the, the brilliant idea and people like to see that. You see it in two hour movies about some life epic uh, that's distilled down to a few tiny points, which is moments of inspiration and maybe shipping the product or something. But it's a long, hard road uh, from one to the other. But there are a bunch of factors that can make it easier or harder. One of the most important ones is the ability to experiment, where if something has changed such that a smart kid can now have an idea and try and experiment, it's a pretty good bet that there's going to be some interesting innovation as a result of that. Now, software is the obvious case for that, where there are so many uh, kind of mythological cases now of people that write Facebook in their bedroom or whatever, uh, all these different cases that are largely true, where you had this amazing thing where one person could buy themselves enough ramen to get through the year, work on a computer, and be, you know, make a company worth millions and millions of dollars or grow to billions of users. But most of the world's not like that. But finding the things that become like that, or at least become more like that than they used to be, is where interesting things happen. And one point that I have sort of a personal touchstone on is what's happened with drones, where uh, a decade ago, I was really proud of the work that I was doing at Armadillo Aerospace with uh, co autonomous, computer-controlled, stabilized rockets. You know, we had these rocket ships that would just could sit there and hover on big tails of fire and move over to other pads. And it was impressive at the time because the only thing that had done anything remotely like that before was this $60 million DCX project that had happened some years before and made a small number of flights. And we wound up making dozens and dozens with multiple flights per day and doing all of this. But when I look back at my wobbly rocket sitting there uh, on the control system code that I wrote and compare it to the aerial ballets and knot tying that people are doing with drones, it's kindergarten scribbling. You know, they are so much more advanced on the control systems now. And the reason they can do that is because all of the teams that do those impressive things with drones, they have a closet full of wreckage of all the drones that they've crashed because they can afford to do that. At Armadillo, we built and crashed two airframes a year, which was a remarkable pace in the, the rocket ship business. But now people can go ahead and say, you can crash drones multiple times a day. You can put them back together and uh, go fly them again and get dozens of flights. And that's how you're able to get these you know, wonderful, magnificent control systems that can do all of these interesting things because they were able to, to crash them into walls and have all these embarrassing fails all of these times. Uh, and to have that much iteration and that many opportunities to succeed for that little money. So things where that can happen more in the industry, uh, that can make a really big difference. Related to that, uh, having the ability to, to score what you're doing is really important. Where in computer science, a lot of things have happened in recent decades where things have gone from random ideas in research papers to things making serious impacts when data sets have been available for public testing and scoring. And so many of the advances in computer vision and machine learning have been as a result of this, where it used to be people just, you would have the three or four images that you would try your technique out on. Maybe you would be able to compare it against somebody else, but rarely rigorously. Nowadays, you have these massive data sets and they have yearly competitions and there are these, the, the pace of innovation on that has been really breathtaking, how much progress has been made. Uh, the old saying about that which you measure improves. I mean, it's not necessarily so, but if you're not measuring it, the chance of it improving is greatly diminished. And on the opposite end of being able to have rapid experimentation is something like, the worst case I can imagine is something like tokamak fusion uh, research, where it takes decades to get the next reactor built, and people spend their entire scientific career waiting for the instrument to be built so they can maybe run some experiments. And that just seems 
tragically bad, where I can't expect any innovation to come out of something like that. Even if they do learn some things uh, in a scientific way, that's not going to be impacting the trajectory of my life. Uh, the pace is just too slow. Now, uh, few innovations are achieved without a lot of people working on them. There are some rare exceptions that, that are likely to be very valuable. Some of the things that have happened with, say, cryptocurrency and blockchain stuff now are, are back to things that have been done by one or a small handful of people. And that's, again, magical and amazing. I, people think that an industry matures and grows up, like gaming certainly did mature and grow up, where in the early days we had a half dozen or a dozen of us that were cutting edge, leading the industry, but now teams are hundreds of people, they're much more risk averse, I, there, there are reasons why things get the way they are, but there are all these new things that pop up, like you know, nobody was thinking about things like cryptocurrency and what could be done with that, and that's, you know, that's quite interesting. But on the other side, there is industrial innova in innovation at an industrial scale, like in the semiconductor industry, where you have tens of thousands of really smart engineers working really hard under intense pressure, and they're delivering Moore's Law, this tidal wave of innovation, over and over again. And that's pretty amazing when you think about it. Uh, some people will say again, well, semiconductors are just different. There's nothing else like that. But there are a bunch of other important things like uh, solar cells and batteries are progressing on this amazing pace also, much faster than people expected. If you go back and look at how what people were predicting for those 10 years or even five years ago, their graphs are terribly wrong. It's going much, much better. And this is kind of what happens when you pour tens of billions of dollars of effort into this, and it's really in a competitive uh, mode, not just kind of a, a blue sky research mode. These are companies that want to own these trillion dollar businesses in the future, and they're delivering amazing innovation. But, uh, but in contrast to that, the vast majority of industries are under-engineered. Sometimes there's only a couple uh, players. They don't think engineering is necessarily a core competence. They might be at a, you know, a stable local uh, optimum for them in the business space. But it's certainly my belief with my optimistic worldview that almost all of those could engineer up and make massive innovations in their industry, the industry that they're in. You know, there's questions about when would it make sense for them to do or how could you pass sort of the, some of the activation energies there. But this is sort of what Elon Musk is doing with the Boring Company, where there's only a couple companies in the world that make these huge tunnel bores. It's a boring industry that not too many people care about. It's not something that engineers go through college saying, I can't wait to go join this industry and put my mark on it. But when you look at this and say, well, we're setting up shop right across the street from SpaceX with uh, all of these really brilliant engineers, I think there is an extremely good chance that he's going to wind up having machines running many times faster than what's going on right now because there is innovation potential sitting on the table waiting for it to be picked up by you know, sufficient application of engineers and capital. And I, it's exciting to think about how much latent potential there is just as, as a result of most people not being in the optimal position. You know, the, the right engineer in the right place uh, is almost certainly not the case right now, where there have been a few times in my life where I could honestly think that I was probably the best person in the entire world for the particular task that I was doing. You know, as a result of experience and history, what I just finished working on, and the timetable that something had to get done, not because I'm the smartest person in the world, but because I had done all of these things, I was the right person for a specific job. And that happens a few times, and it's great. This is like, okay, this is peak value for what I'm doing. But most of the time, I work at some you know, more modest multiple of what any other person could be doing on some of the things. And this vision that in the future, maybe we will be able to pull teams together more quickly from the right people at the right time. And this was always the dream of telepresence, that you could have remote workers in different places, and you could pull this brilliant person from, you know, from Shanghai over here, and this person from Canada over here, and work with this person from San Francisco, and put together your dream team for some six-month sprint on a project. But it doesn't really happen right now. And that is one of our, our lower key hopes for virtual reality eventually helping with this in some ways, where video conferencing technology has made a lot of strides, but it's still not like you're there. There's still some things lost. It's still not a great collaboration. So there might be something that, you know, that makes a big difference there in the future. 
Now again, capital is important for a lot of these things. We have some brilliant things that don't require a lot of capital to do, but even if you just want to bring the engineers to bear, uh, engineers are expensive, and if you want to bring a whole lot of them to bear on a problem and work on it, uh, it does take a lot of money to do that. And it's easy to point at failures, things that, that didn't get funded or that turned out to be really important, but I do think that in general the market does well. Uh, I mean, it isn't easy, but I've seen a lot of people raise a lot of money for ventures to get a shot at it. Sometimes maybe not enough. Uh, often it's because they didn't deserve to get more. Uh, in the case of like all the aerospace companies that I've watched, it's an interesting kind of set of trajectories where lots of them were always complaining about, oh, I couldn't do this because you know, the two big scapegoats are, oh, the regulatory side of things, uh, it's the, the damn government's keeping me from flying my rockets. And that was really not true. It was, we were at Armadillo, our little eight person team was able to get all the launch licenses and permits and all that stuff. Uh, it just, it was work, it wasn't trivial, but that wasn't what held people back. And then it was, oh, I couldn't raise a billion dollars to build my scramjet whatever. Uh, and well, the investors were correct to not give you the billion dollars in most cases. <laughs> um, and then we've, you know, we've seen lots of the super success stories where things do play out very, very well. Uh, I unfortunately don't have any really strong advice for dealing with venture capitalists. I, I mean, my uh, id Software was self-funded. We grew organically. Armadillo, I just paid for out of my own pocket. I, I was involved with the Oculus raising, but it was really just being pointed. It's like, here, John, go impress Mark Andreessen. Here, John, go impress Mark Zuckerberg. And that was about the extent of my, uh, my involvement with uh, the money side of things at Oculus. I, one of the things that can be problematic with the market solving things is kind of these pockets of stability and risk aversion, where if we think about the solution space for everything as this big multi-dimensional space, or even just think about it as 3D with hills and local minimums, where a lot of times companies will be in a comfortable, stable place. And it may well be that there's a far better place for them to be sort of over the metaphorical hill there. But if they're stable and comfortable where they are, the idea of taking a risk and going out somewhere else uh, does not seem terribly appealing. And one of the, the best examples of this is the, like the United States launch apparatus for, for rocketry, where it's a stable business, they have their guaranteed government contracts, uh, the satellite business is, yeah, they, they're happy with uh, a few percent failure rate, their payloads cost a half a billion dollars sometimes, they don't want you messing around with things there. If you have some bright young engineer that says, I've got an idea that might save us a bunch of money on our rockets, uh, but it might also blow up. I am the person that's launching the half billion dollar satellite says, no, we've worked into our, all of our figures close with the current launch costs. That's just okay. And this is what happened for, for decades after we learned how to launch rockets. We learned how to launch them barely okay. And satellites were a valid business for that. And it just worked. They insured it. They knew that sometimes they'd blow up. They had hedged their risks on that. And that was just fine. When the companies, uh, when Boeing or uh, makes or any of the United Launch Alliance companies, they made a new rocket, it was very conservative. Um, they expected it to work on the first try. And in contrast, SpaceX goes out there and has this lovely highlight reel of failure after failure. And I used to do that at Armadillo too, which was you know, great. We put out and say, all right, here's how we crash this one and then this one and then this one. Uh, I was so heartened to see Elon uh, do that for most of his flights. And now they're happy to just show everything that they've crashed over the past. And it's a lovely reel of uh, tens or hundreds of millions of dollars of rockets just uh, doing terrible things. But that was what it took to get to this level of innovation where, okay, now they could, they've got this much cheaper build infrastructure, they're reusing rockets. This was the dream of so much of the aerospace industry for so long, and they just went and did it. And now that means everybody else is in a really, really bad position. But it took, uh, it took someone basically with Elon's guts to go all in and say, I'm going to try to do it this unconventional way. And uh, he succeeded, and he's going on to great things here, but he easily could have flamed out. And there were, you know, there were dozens, people looked at it where there was 40 years in the wilderness for aerospace, where we went to the moon, and then people thought, well, where do we get our commercial rockets? When are we going to be flying people to these, uh, to the different locations? When do we get our moon base? And, you know, 40 years go by, uh, 
And there were lots of companies there, and people look at it and say, if you haven't succeeded after 40 years, doesn't that just mean that it's not going to happen? Uh, what makes you think you're any different? But the point that I would make about it is there were very, very few actual attempts. And uh, innovation implies a level of failure. I, there are, it is possible to do something innovative with high probability of success if you are willing to be so very ineffective about it, like the space shuttle. The space shuttle succeeded on its very first, it flew manned its very first flight. So they were so conservative in what they would do, and it is so expensive. It was costing, you know, depending on how you account for it, half a billion or a billion dollars per, uh, per launch of the space shuttle in the end. It was in no way effective. They could have been flying the older rockets, just make lots of them, uh, and be much more cost effective. But if you were willing to go and blow up lots of things, trying these different things, eventually you can hit on a formula that can actually be a lot better. And uh, you know, there's some other possible bridges across those gaps where the X Prize was interesting. The idea was that there was a theory that taking people just up into space, not into orbit, was something that could be a business. And people had done studies on it, but nobody was willing to actually put in the money to try to build something. And so the idea behind the X Prize was that, what if we put up a $10 million prize for the first person that demonstrates this existence proof that it could be done, which would then break down the barrier, and then people could put in the real money to kind of build this out uh, afterwards. And it was very interesting looking at this with hindsight where it achieved uh, its notional goal. Bert Rutan flew Spaceship One twice over 100 kilometers uh, with a pilot and ballast for, uh, for where the other passengers would be, which was pretty remarkable. Uh, it unfortunately did kind of fail for the larger term vision of Virgin Galactic came in and threw a pile of money into it, but I was worried about this from the beginning. Virgin Galactic has their whole brand and name associated to it, so they were much more conservative with what they could do. They, a lot of people said, you could just take this, turn it around, and start flying people. People were lined up that were willing to pay a couple hundred thousand dollars to go take a ride on Spaceship One but it got turned into the big process where the large company comes in with the branding and the styling and the new design that's got to carry more people. And as of yet, it still hasn't flown any paying customers over a decade later, which is you know, really pretty deeply unfortunate. So, and the, and the last thing here is that time does really matter. And this is something that uh, you can be too early to succeed or too late to matter. And this is something that I did only really come to grips with uh, kind of midway through my career. I was well known early on talking about the games to say, I, I'm not going to give a release date. It'll be done when it's done. We'll ship it when we're finished. And this was sort of us thumbing our nose at the, the poor developers that lived advance to advance on milestones from their publisher that would sometimes be forced to push something out that they really weren't happy with. And I thought that just saying, being an absolutist, well, we will put it out when we are happy with it. I'm, I have walked away from that. I've pretty much recanted that idea of saying when it's done is the right way to go because this value of time really does matter. And this, this was driven home to me as our game started taking longer and longer to write where our last, uh, the last game that, uh, that I shipped at id Software was Rage and it took us six years to produce that game. Entire tastes in gaming can change. You've got an entire new generation of, uh, of people in your demographic in that point, and you just can't make, you cannot expect a design to survive that long and still be optimal. So I think that very much there are intelligent trades to be had where you say, no, I'm going to restrain my desire to do something grand here because timeliness actually matters. I can be a little bit less grand and ship a little bit sooner and it can be net better. And in hindsight, I much would have rather shipped two games in that time frame, even if they were less ambitious in various different ways. And I think that does apply to a lot of things. The, the healthiest startups are the, one that, the ones that know their runway's limited, that they have a limited amount of time to get airborne and get revenue and bring their customers in, that you can't just sit around and lounge. And that's a hazard that all the big companies have. Once you are big and successful, uh, you may be worried about your bonus or your review or something like that, but you're not worried about the company going insolvent all of a sudden and wondering where you know, your rent's going to come from. And it does make a difference to how people approach their work. Um, when something has to get done, it's more likely than if you're like, well, this is a P1 on our list. Maybe we'll get to it. It's not really that important. So 
I, I do you know, we encourage people to look at things with a great deal of urgency. And that does kind of come back to the work-life balance bit where there are companies that can be done in the sedate, conservative way. And, you know, that's great. Most of the world is probably like that. But if we are talking about invention and innovation, I think a lot of that is still burning the candle at both ends. I, you know, and going a little bit close to the flame sometimes. So um, I think that's probably a reasonable time to kind of head over to our questions. Mm. Okay. <laughs> how much time do we have left? We have about 20, how much, 20 minutes, 15 minutes? Okay. Awesome. All right, we'll turn on my So there are lots of, lots of questions. Um, so thank you, first of all, for your comments on innovation. I, I thought it was a, a fascinating, and I was taking uh, copious notes. Uh, and so we're going to kind of go back and forth. We've got some good audience questions and then some uh, other questions. And so, uh, John, the first question uh, is, how might uh, emerging technologies like virtual reality change industries that are slow to adopt technology like the legal industry? So there's actually a really interesting thing that I and several other people have some real concerns about in regards to virtual reality in the legal industry, where there have already been some moves to using virtual reality to do reenactments in different ways, where you can make people say, I am, it's like, here's the scene that we've recreated, here's what you would see from this position, here's what you'd see from this position. But the problem is virtual reality is virtual and it's completely mutable. You can make it look like anything you want and you can make it very compelling. And the people that get good at this, that get good at selling presence and you know, selling uh, you know, narrative sense and making you feel what they want you to, you've got more ability to do that in an immersive environment than you have with anything on a screen. And so there's some, some valid concern for how that may play out and how Judges are going to have to start thinking about uh, what they're going to allow and what they're going to caveat in different ways. I don't know where that's going to go, but that's something that is already sort of top of mind in some cases. Okay. It, so uh, we, have a, we have a question um, related to um, how you go about uh, prioritizing and choosing uh, your projects and then also skill acquisition. How long do you give yourself to acquire a skill and so the skill acquisition side is I am that's very topical for me because just I three weeks ago I took a, a one week retreat where this is something I used to do on a really regular basis but it had been a few years that I had had a gap with this i um, and it used to be that I would just go to a hotel away from an airport someplace to just kind of live sort of a monastic week uh, working on something sometimes it was just crunching through on work but realistically I'm at best, maybe 70% more efficient if I'm just crunching through tasks, but it's best used for times when I want to really learn something new, when I want to be in that possessive phase to immerse myself in some new technology. Uh, just this recent one, I was doing convolutional neural networks. I kind of doubled up two things where I took OpenBSD, which was a, a Unix that I hadn't worked with that I wanted to spend some time in, and convolutional neural networks where I wrote some stuff from scratch, which is my method of learning is always very much bottoms up. Most people would take this as download the latest Google library and run through the instructionals there, but I start the other way. I want to write it from scratch in C so I know what every multiply does in every step of the process. And that's just you know, how I approach the things. Uh, and I had a great time with that. I, before that, a couple years ago, I spent several months working on I, classical computer vision things for, uh, for position tracking, visual odometry. And a couple years before that, learning my first Android stuff as I started on the virtual reality. So it's an important thing for me to, to keep doing this because that's honestly what I enjoy the most. I, it, you will get to a point of feeling stale if you're just using your, even if you advance to the top of your field and then you're just using those skills uh, over and over again it's not nearly as rewarding and exciting. And I remember distinctly, before I got into aerospace, I felt that I was peeking out in computer graphics where I remember being young and every book had stuff I didn't understand that was fascinating, that I was eager to learn, and it was an adventure through everything. 
But by that point in my life, I could read a whole book and think, did I get anything out of this? Was this worth my time to read it? And everything that I did learn became precious. You know, it was like a new gym that showed me something new. But then I jumped over into aerospace, and it's like I'm fumbling around learning how to run a lathe and what cutting tools do, and uh, as well as all the engineering side of things. And it was fabulous. Uh, you know, similarly, some of the things looking at computer vision and machine learning, things that I do not know that much about, although I can bring more of my skill set to bear there. Uh, it's, you know, it's interesting and valuable, but I am, uh, I am a slave to the product. Uh, product is first for me, where I have, I have feelings sometimes where I like the idea of going and being a researcher and researching and just following one thing all the way down the rabbit hole, but I always get drawn off by the notion of user value. And I do think that's one of the things that makes me most valuable to, to companies, is that I'm not just about the abstract ivory tower idea. I feel the fascination for that, but I'm much more strongly drawn towards it's the product and the user that's important. You know, that's why we're doing this. That's what value means, is to provide the value to the other people. So I, if anything, I'm harder on myself. Like Again, there were several years that I had not done my retreat because I was just heads down product all the time. So as a, as a follow-up to that, one of the, the themes in your, in your talk was failure and sort of the ability to fail, which leads to, to innovation. So my question is, uh, if that's part of the process, how do you know when to give up on an idea and, and move on? That can be tough. I, ideally, that's why, like I said, I've gotten much more openly aggressive and uh, antagonistic to my ideas because you can go a long time fooling yourself where some part of your mind might be aware that there might be a problem in things in a certain way and you can avoid looking at that while you're just kind of writing the I've got a great idea I think this is going to work but if you if you change your mindset to actively hunting for the weakest spots if that becomes your goal in your game to bust it quick uh, that helps a lot because I can remember looking back at some things that that I rode for a while, thinking that's like okay, it's not quite working, but I think I can, you know, I think I can make it work without looking really hard at why is it not working and is it fundamental. So it sounds like failing fast then is 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 your your current philosophy as much really. as possible. And there there are explicit steps you can take there where not just waiting for it to fail fast, but trying to break it fast. Got it. Okay. All right, so switch gears a little bit and talk about uh, other, other industries. And so um, we have a question um, about uh, blockchain. And so the question is, what are your views on blockchain and innovations uh, in uh, this industry that we might not expect or we might not be thinking about right now? So I'm not a blockchain expert. This is one of those things that I conceivably could have gone and done a week and written the, you know, written a blockchain client from scratch in C. That would be the way I would approach doing this uh, if I was to kind of move into that industry. But I do know enough about it to have an intelligent conversation about it. And while it's amusing to look at the hype chain surrounding a lot of things, we've had VR hype chains, but the, the big ones are blockchain and machine learning, where you make a startup by just somehow mixing those words in with something that you're applying it to. <laughs> and, yeah, but that's not as crazy, you know, it's not as uh, dishonest as it kind of sounds like that, because a large part of my point was that this cross fertilization of different ideas is the ability to apply innovation to practically everything comes from doing things like that. And yes, a lot of them will be silly, ridiculous ideas, but there probably will be some deeply important ones. And the blockchain is cool because it really is something kind of new under the sun. This is a, uh, a technology, this global public ledger without the central authority is clearly interesting and valuable, and it's relatively new compared to most aspects of computer technology. And then, of course, the whole thriller aspect of it, of it about nobody knowing who the original author uh, blockchain paper was just makes it all the more interesting. So I'm not an expert, uh, and a lot of the things people are applying it to are probably wrong and silly, but I do think that there is some real deep value there. And so now, with respect to the aerospace industry, and you mentioned this a little bit in your talk, uh, the question is, what are some of the largest legal and regulatory challenges involved with starting a space travel company? So I touched on this a little bit. I, you know, there's a couple aspects to it. There is the, the big things that people talk about are 
you need to get a launch license. There's a few different things that you need to, to fly under the FAA. Uh, there's a class called, um, you can have an experimental permit for things that are classically gigantic model rockets, but they're bigger than you'd think. You can have like tons of thrust. These can be fairly potent and you can get a lot done under this regime. Then there are experimental permits, which is for things that are manned vehicles potentially that can be flying all the way to space and doing interesting things. And then there are um, the full launch license. And interestingly, it's theoretically the same launch license whether you're launching a Falcon Heavy or uh, like one of the last Stig rockets that I was doing at Armadillo. Uh, it covers that whole broad range. Now, there's a huge amount of regulatory paperwork that needs to get done for this, but it is not the thing that blocked so many companies. The whining companies that were like, oh, the government's keeping me from doing it. No, they just didn't put in the work. It took one guy at our company working with the FAA, going through the, the, uh, all of the paperwork to get it done. And there was a lot of you know, things that, I, that frustrated me a lot where we submit an application that has everything of, everything necessary in there and it comes back with a rejection that basically means not heavy enough, send us more paper. So we figure out a way to say the same thing in twice <laughs> as many words and send it back and you go through that a few times and eventually I, you, know, you wind up being okay. I, the other side of it though that's less, uh, less obvious is just how you conduct your operations. And this was one of those things that I've got some of my, my great Texas rocket stories uh, that I have where we did most of our early development just in an industrial, uh, industrial park area in Garland. Uh, night would fall and we'd roll up the garage doors and we'd fire rocket engines out, out the back and uh, have our test stand there with big tails of fire flying across the parking lot. And generally, it was not a problem. Uh, one time we had uh, a police cruiser come by. We had just fired an engine that had made a large plume of steam going way up that was probably visible for a mile away. Uh, and a, not surprisingly, a cruiser pulled in. It's like, what's going on here? And I say, <laughs> well, uh, we build rocket ships here. Let me show you around. And we, I, we showed them all around. And I uh, was having such a good time on the tour that eventually his partner in the car was honking the horn, telling him to get back out. And he said, well, it looks like you guys know what you're doing. Carry on. <laughs> and we did. <laughs> and so there's, I, uh, you know, there are certainly places where that would not go over nearly as well, but we had good experiences here. Uh, the few times that I did uh, talk with like our local representatives, I, you know, or people in city positions, it really always went well. People thought it was exciting, the idea of, I am, you know, building rocket ships. Then we were doing things like the rocket racing with manned people in it, the Lunar Lander Challenge. We did work for NASA. And like out at Caddo Mills, where we had our, uh, our airfield shop, they were pretty happy with it. It's like, yes, there is some recognized outside possibility that something could go horribly wrong. All of our systems could fail. And our rocket could fly over and, uh, you know, get someone's cow or house or even. Uh, it's a possibility there, but it was, all deemed uh, acceptable risk. Great. Uh, so let's turn out to a couple of, of, of personal questions, more about how, how you work. And you, 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 you also talked about this in your talk, and you said that there's nothing uh, wrong with a little obsession, especially to get things done. Um, and so we have a question about, uh, about work-life work -life balance. And I guess the, the gist of this question is really, uh, you do have a family. You do have do have a wife and kids, and so how do you uh, how do you manage uh, being a being a husband, being a father with the work that you do? So it sure helps to have a, a wife that's supportive of what you're doing. I mean, if there's an adversarial uh, point there, that's not going to go over well. But there's there's over a hundred hours in the week after you're sleeping. Even if you are working the 60 hours a week or something that people say, oh, this is unsustainable crunch, that's still 40 hours left in the in the week. So I walk my kids to school every day. You know, we talk every night. Uh, I am gone much of the day. Sunday's family day. I don't do anything else. Uh, you know, instead of that. So I'm, you know, I'm down 20% from what my peak would be uh, otherwise, and that's a trade that I'm more than happy to make right now. But that doesn't mean that, oh, you've only got 40 hours that you can put into your, uh, your life's work. And that's what, a, you know, it's, you can say work-life balance or life's work. And what I do with my engineering is my life's work. And I have 
few external hobbies or other things that I do. Uh, I put the time that I have available that I'm not devoting to more important things with my family, I put them towards my work. And that winds up still being a really significant amount of time per week and I get a lot done. Now, what did, what did that schedule look like before you were married with kids? What so was the big that things like? that were different was I used to be on a rolling schedule where I, I would work almost on a 25 hour day schedule where I would kind of get up an hour later. I didn't have an alarm clock, and so I would get up an hour later every day. And I liked, I often I enjoy working through the night when there's nobody there. Uh, I love coming in on Saturdays when everything is peaceful and quiet and I can get, there's certain work that I can't get done during the week when messages are going off and meetings are being scheduled and Saturdays are great. So I used to have much more of the, the late night work and I would be cycling around always at weird hours. People wouldn't know when they could expect to, to get me and I would work Sundays as well. Uh, and those are the main things that, that have changed. I get up, I make the kids lunches and I get them to school in the morning. and. My wife goes, I, she pokes me about this a lot where I used to just say, it's like, oh, that's gonna ruin me in all these ways. And, <laughs> and surprisingly, the schedule is probably a good thing on net where I, when I noticed on my, uh, on my retreats away, not so much on this one, but on the last one that I did like four years ago, I very quickly fell back into my 25 hour schedule, you mm. know, going around, but I found that I would spend a little bit more time in bed. I would lose some hour, some time there. And I surprisingly don't mind being the first person up in the morning in our household, which is weird. And I wouldn't have believed that 10 years ago. <laughs> so the, the retreats, you go away by, your, by yourself and this is for seven days? Yeah, usually. Okay, all right. Um, well, let, let me ask you a follow-up question mm -hmm. for that one. So this is once a year. So it used to be reasonably regularly. This last one that I took, I hadn't for three years before that, I think. Uh, again, because Oculus being a startup, I just felt that I couldn't do that. It was more important that mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I take a family vacation once a year with our family. We go somewhere, but uh, we have this annoying little thing at Facebook. We've got the, the PTO ferry that sends you emails saying, you have maxed out your, you know, your maximum uh, days in your PTO bank. You should take some PTO. And I'm like, go away, leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> so it reminds you to take some personal yeah. time off. I mean, off. Facebook has a lot of programs like yeah. that where they are you know, big on a lot of the wellness things and they're very, very proud of their uh, best place to work, you know, best company to work for rating that they got this year. And it is, uh, yeah, I speak very highly of Facebook as a place to work. Okay. All right, so I think we have time for, for, for uh, one more question and so, um, I imagine that the answer to this will be you probably will have a, a difficult time deciding, but the question is, what is your favorite game that you've, that you've worked on? And then uh, the follow-up or the second question is, what was the most challenging game that you worked on? So those on? are actually pretty, the, I've got stock answers for that because that hasn't changed in, you know, in quite a number of years. My personal favorite game was uh, Quake 3 Arena. Uh, and I, it fits my style because it was a pure play. Uh, it didn't have a lot of uh, kind of extraneous things in it. It was simple and elegant. It was the first thing to major title to require graphics acceleration. It was not our most successful title, but I still look back at that as kind of the purest of our titles. Uh, by far the hardest one uh, early on was the original Quake where we were we were still going through this process of uh, games were taking longer, we weren't adapting well to it internally, we were having friction with some of the founders, uh, some of the design decisions didn't work out. It turned out to be a certainly a seminal game and there's probably more game industry people that look back at that as the thing that got them into it, but it was pretty grueling to get that out. And even there, that was you know, two year development compared to some of the things where we spent much longer on the later games, but it wasn't quite as much of a pressure cooker with all the different things going on. And we had mm -hmm. learned some things after that. Okay, good. Well, so for the students out there that are aspiring uh, developers or aspiring lawyers uh, that might have an idea that they think is, is innovative, do you, do you have any last words of advice for, for them? So I have, some, I, I have some stock advice for people interested in gaming. I'm, I do get approached by people a lot, it's like here's my brilliant gaming idea, and can you help me make it or can you help me find someone to make it? And that never goes anywhere. That's not, uh, you know, that's not a useful direction to pursue. Uh, but the technical people that I talk to, I, I do 
offer a plan of attack that I think will get them to a place where they will be valuable to companies. And I used to recommend specifically a two-pronged approach where on the one hand, work with a commercial modern game uh, and build a mod, ideally with a team, where you're working inside a large code base with multiple people. You're not going to understand the whole thing, but you need to make something fun. That's the essence of what you would likely be doing at the company. But for the people that want to take their value beyond that kind of baseline level, I also recommend that people try to build a classic game, whether it's Pac-Man or Wolfenstein 3D, completely from scratch. You know, using modern development tools and the existence proof and the value of history, it's a lot easier than it was back then, but it's still not a trivial project to learn everything, to learn how to do the video swapping and the input and all of these low-level details. Because I still think so much value does, represent, does come from knowing the entire stack. So much of my innovations have come from knowing that there's this big mess of things. You can cut out this, bypass this over here, and collapse things down, where most people only learn the highest levels now. And I think there is a lot of value of knowing things all the way down to the metal. But today, I would also add a third prong to that, where the game engines like the Unity and Unreal, uh, the communities and toolkits and support ecosystem is so good now that it's not that big of a challenge to write a pretty decent looking modern game by yourself or with a few other people. Uh, it's not going to have all the bells and whistles, but I am pretty confident that the people that can kind of demonstrate those three directions, that that shows that they're a valuable person and they can probably uh, find a company to work with them. In the general sense about how do you take an innovative idea, one of the random things you might brush against. It's like, oh, I figured out a better way to do light fixtures. You know, how do you wind up uh, turning that into a company? And I wish I had better uh, suggestions for that because, like I said, I think in the, possi the potential for innovation is all around us. And that might almost be one of the most important meta innovations that we could have is mm. ways that we can make it easier for these things to happen. And lots of this happens in the software world where it is so much easier to spin up a company and get all of your documents done in the cloud, get your servers in the cloud, and it has made innovation there so much easier than it ever was before, and that spawns so much of the, the modern internet age. I wish there were more things like that for, for other uh, you know, hardware aspects. And there's things going on that I'm only tangentially familiar with in uh, you know, all the things that go on in the Chinese hardware scene and the way people can do amazing turnarounds. People get an idea and it goes from concept to product coming out of factories in small number of months. And that's deep magic that I, I, I'm in awe of in some ways and don't really understand the depths of. So there's, there's possibilities there and I think in so many ways the future is bright, but uh, outside of my narrow field, I can't give really great advice. God, thank you very much, John. This, is, uh, this has been great. Um, I invite everyone to join us for the reception um, after. I think John might stick around for a little mm -hmm. bit, but please join me in, uh, in uh, thanking John. All right, thank you.